Do it again. Miss Liz is always popping in the closet and not coming out of that closet. I did it earlier and I did it again in two seconds of a little blank screen. But we are here and welcome to everybody out there who's listening to Tea Time tonight. We are joined with an incredible Western word saga author. And I mean, we're going to be talking some Wild West. We're going to be talking some history. We're going to be talking about all those good things. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab a beer, grab a glass of whiskey if you'd like. And we're going to have ourselves a good old strong cup of tea tonight. So I'm going to get David in here, but we're going to do all the good stuff that Miss Liz does. And then we're going to sit and we're going to spill it. Good old TEA with David A. Bowles. Uh, and I just see, I think I have his last name wrong on that. I'm going to have to fix that. So disclaimer on Miss Liz's Tea Times live show. Miss Liz is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by Miss Liz is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me. me Miss Liz at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I, Miss Liz, welcome to. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea times are done on Thursday this year for Miss Liz. So let me get David in here and let me get that fix. I'm going to just get David to share a little bit and spill some good old tea with you guys. So welcome, David. Thank, thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm glad to be here with the, I'm get, meeting more and more Canadian friends. Uh, <laughs> I've got a lot of friends in Canada. Uh, and by the way, the name is Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S, like Can Camellia Bowles. Oh, Bowles. Uh, yeah, Bowles. Um, and uh, any, I, I, we have some spelling problems on it sometimes, but but uh, you you got it right, David A. Bowles on the screen there, and that well, I, you, I see what down on the guest thing is. You got a D in there, but where you had it in the uh, 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 in your great little uh, intro, it was spelled properly. So, so yeah, you, yeah so great. I'm going to get that fixed in about 30 seconds. I'm just going to get you to share a little bit about who you are, David, yeah. and how you got into the whole writing of the 
Westward, Westward uh, Saga and all the incredible now it's Westward Sagas now. Sagas. <laughs> Look that at means, me. I think I got into the whiskey. <laughs> in, in, te in Texas speak, that's a that's a long story. <laughs> it's a saga. <laughs> So I'm going to get you to share a little bit of that, David, and I'm just going to fix this little error up. And so you'll see a thing pop up and down, but it'll be like 30 seconds. But I'm going to get you to share with the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do and how you got into the writing. Well, uh, I had a story that had to be told. And uh, I, I heard the story the first time on the front porch of my home in Austin, Texas. Uh, we had a little family gathering and I had uh, grandparents and I had aunts and uncles and and uh, they told a story about a little boy not far from where our house was where we were sitting on the front porch was captured by Indians in Austin, Texas in 1841 and uh, how the Indians took him off to Santa Fe, New Mexico to sell him and uh, 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 his uncle who was a Texas Ranger. Uh, he, had, he had retired actually from being a Texas Ranger and thought he was gonna get in the real estate business in Austin, Texas. Now we're talking about 1841. The town was founded in 1839. And uh, he took off after the boy alone. The sheriff and Sam Houston, who was in Austin at the time, Sam Houston didn't live there. He was the past president of the Republic of Texas, but. Uh, back in those days, uh, uh, the president couldn't serve more than two years, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, he 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 was there as a representative of of uh, St. Augustine County in East Texas. But I heard that story, uh, and uh, I was amazed at the story. As one one of the aunts and uncles would tell the story, well, I heard it this way, and another heard it that way, and but it was all kind of the basic same story. And I kept trying to get the story. And when I got old enough to get up and start doing some research, I started putting it all together. And it really came together in about 1982 uh, when I had an uncle who decided he brought over a big old feed sack with a Bible in it and a a bunch of records and things, and it was my great grandmother's Bible and the family records from 1840. Oh, wow. And uh, probably would have never gotten around to writing a book or finishing the research had I not been in a pretty bad motorcycle accident. And so, three years of rehab allowed me to go through those papers and start doing my research. And I was just amazed and I kept thinking, somebody's got to write a story about this. And I talked to some great authors, one in particular, a ghostwriter you may know by the name of uh, Cecil Murphy. And Cecil Murphy, he's the one that wrote Fra uh, Franklin Graham's uh, biography and a lot of things like that. And I approached him and he told me, he says, you've done the research, you've already got the characters in your mind uh, what they should be and how they reacted and that sort of thing. And he says, he says, no author is going to be able to make you happy with that story. And he was right. So I started writing it uh, uh, around 1998, uh, trying to put it together into a story. And uh, my first book, naturally, I had made a lot of changes and stuff as things went along. And uh, I found more information. I kept getting more information. And I had a lot of help from other family members who, who, who had some accurate information and some documents. They didn't even really know what they had, but I, I was able to go through them and read them and find out some of the stuff, some of the letters especially. But the biggest thing yeah, to answer your question is I, I wrote it because I got into writing it because I couldn't find anybody to write it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's usually the best way to do it, right? Is write our own stories because sometimes yes. we have to have that that heartfelt story. You know, uh, when we try to tell somebody else how to write it, it doesn't come out the way that we want it to sound or look, right? Exactly. And I've had a couple of 
different families approach me wanting to write their family stories, and I, I said the same thing that Cecil Murphy told me. So. so, so you have some really incredible covers. So, where did the covers come from? Well, you like those covers. Well, I, I do. I really like the covers. I gotta tell you. Uh, that this is interesting for anybody getting off and right. You had to realize that I wrote those first two books prior to the digital world. Ooh. And and uh, I had to go to, I, I had to get in and learn how, how the how the typesetting and all that sort of thing worked. And I kept hearing about, you know, things getting digitized and that, that sort of thing. But uh, the first two books I did was uh, on Offset Press. And that was interesting where they had to take the 16 pages and have them front and back. And watching that, I actually went to the printer and watched them print it, you know, stood by, stood by. I like to drove them crazy, but I stood by. And my first two books were printed. And I got to tell you, the, sec the first book uh, 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 and, the, and the first book and the second book, I hired for my cover a well-known artist and paid him a big price. And the picture that they did on a, t on a canvas looked great for the book. But once, once Amazon got in the book business and I decided to put them on, I was one of the first authors to go on Amazon with those two books. And I took those, <laughs> oh, that, that painted oil and they were done in beautiful oil. And my daughter has those <laughs> hanging in her house now. They make beautiful, they made a beautiful, they made beautiful portraits, but they just didn't go over, you know. And so I finally was convinced I had to do it digitally. And uh, I, I found a graphic artist. Uh, the first graphic artist did, it, did my uh, three books. And she's gone on to other things now. I would have had her do the, the last two. Uh, but I've had, I had the last two were done by different, but I interviewed a lot of, author, uh, a lot of uh, uh, graphic artists before I, chose, before I chose one. I was really particular about, and I pay it high dollar. They, they, you know, I, I hear people say, oh, I got my cover done for $200. Well, I wouldn't be bragging about that, you know, but I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, I was going to say, I don't know, but I got a feeling that this last book is going to win, uh, the cover is going to win an award, award for the cover. Oh, uh, it's oh, gorgeous. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Now, I got to, I got to tell you. Uh, another story, if you if you don't mind. Oh no! Uh, okay. you, you asked about that. Is how strange this digital world and doing Zoom and stuff is. Uh, the, the the editor that I chose had uh, done uh, a previous book. Uh, she this was her second book she had done for me, and <laughs> she lives in Boston. And so we're, we're doing the work and we're talking and we're, I said, well, you know, uh, the, 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 edit, uh, the, uh, uh, the artist that we used before is not, not in the business anymore and doesn't, doesn't want to get into it. And uh, she, I, she said, well, I know somebody. And I said, well, give me their information. And she sent me their email and uh, she didn't send the phone number, but she sent, you know, today everybody works by email. Yeah, so yeah. I started, uh, I drew a kind of a rough picture of what I wanted, a stick man type, because I'm not an artist. And I, I, I kind of put it back. I had wanted the hotel, the Hotel Rio, because the Hotel Rio is really important because that was the sheriff's office. They didn't, they didn't have the money to build, you know, they didn't have a jail, they didn't have anything, they, but a hotel, was his office truly? I mean, this because this even though it's a fictional story, uh, it, the, the events actually happened, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to get this done and explain to her over the phone what I wanted, and not over the phone, but through email. And so I asked Janice. I said, you know, if I could talk to this woman, I think I could explain better, you know. And she said, well. 
he says, uh, here, I'll give you her phone number. He gave me the phone number, and the minute I saw it, it was the same, the same area code as mine. So when I called her, I said, can I ask you where you live? And she says, I live in San Antonio, Texas. And she didn't live very far from me. We met for lunch, and, and I was able to sit there with her and try and explain to her. The big thing, if you notice in the back, that that's the Rio Grande River. And that's how it looked back in those days. Now, it doesn't look like that now because they built a big dam up, oh, wow. up above there. So you wouldn't see that winding river. You'd see a big, big lake is what you see. But at that time, it was a winding little, little river that went by. And then uh, it was Davis Landing down there. And that's where they came in and made an army camp. And the city just was one of those cities that sprang up overnight due to that army camp being there. So, uh, but she did a wonderful job and, and I'm really proud of those books. And I don't know if you notice I have them on display right behind my back. <laughs> I can see them a little bit. A little bit. They're a little far <laughs> back there, but yes, I'm real proud, proud of those. And thank no, you they're for gorgeous. asking about that cover. You're not the first person that said that about the cover. I don't yeah. know if my book's going to win any awards, but I know, I know that cover is going to. <laughs> No, they're gorgeous. Really, really gorgeous. There's a lot of work that was put into those covers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you, you know, you, you can, to me, I can see a, a cheap book cover. I know it's, a, you know, or it's something that you just got off a of line themselves, created yourselves, or they made four or five boxes and used two different colors and, you know, did it in about 15 minutes. And, and I spent two or three years writing my book. I want, I want it to be dressed up. I want it dressed up for the ball. So by writing these books, David, what did you learn about your family? You know, I learned more. <laughs> yeah, as I started writing the books, I had to, I had to create scenes and how did that happen and this and that. And I really began to fill in a lot of the blanks writing and write, writing the story. And uh, some of it I had to create because a good example of that. People ask, well, what do you mean? Show me what you mean. And I said, well, look, look at that cover on my, my second book, which is uh, the, which is the uh, uh, Comanche Trace. Uh, Will, the Texas Rangers, riding a white horse. I tell them, I said, that horse died long before I was born. So I had no idea what color that horse was. <laughs> so, but most of the story, story is pretty active. But uh, I researched the family all the way back to uh, to their home, the original home in, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, when they came over from Ireland about 1712. And so uh, the family had been here, has been here a little over 300 years. Wow. And I've got cousins coming out. Now, amazing thing is, it's not just on my father's side, but on my mother's side at all. And they grew up, they were true Texas pioneers. And actually, I, I have here, I want to show you a picture of my mother, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't <laughs> mind at all. When she was, she was 17 years old. Oh, wow, look at her. <laughs> She's beautiful. And, yeah, and she she was a cowgirl. And she was a cowgirl and married a cowboy and, and, <laughs> and met a lot of cowboys in the family. Just about everybody was in the cattle business because that's just about a, that, what, what we had. We had we had cedar cattle and pecans, and, that, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was country country living. And and I, I'm glad I had the I'm the last generation of my family to to have enjoyed that. My children now are living in the city, and you know they don't have animals and. And I had to explain to them, to the grandchildren, how how milk didn't just come out in one of those little, yes. little, little cardboard boxes, you know. Well, here in Canada, we have them in bags. You have them in bags. Yes, I'll tell you. And I'll tell you, I'm amazed at the difference in the cost of milk in Canada versus the United States. And I couldn't figure that out. And it's it's government subsidies is what it is it's the reason yeah. it's the dairy association and the united states is a very good lobbyist <laughs> but, 
So <laughs> what kind of feedback are you getting back from your books, uh, David, from it's the, been, from the been, like different Liz, age ranges? Liz, it's, it's been wonderful. Um, I have, you know, we get these back. Some of them are professional uh, reviews. Some, uh, you know, are from readers. The, the re originally, the advanced readers were the ones that really uh, surprised me. And uh, I have I have a group of advanced readers who I've I've got got to know over the years who read heartily. Uh, and and those advanced readers, I rely on them uh, so much. And each one of them is different. I've got one that's a cowboy that lives in a barn in Lubbock, Texas with his horse. And I rely on him to give me accurate information about uh, uh, tackle, you know, uh, for our horses and, and hardware and things like that and wagons. And, and he's my uh, technical for that sort of thing. And uh, then I have uh, a gal, that she is just one of those that just can... She can spot an eye that's not dotted across the room, you know. <laughs> and so I use a, a vast array of different people from different walks of life who would know about certain things, and uh, that's worked very well. And their reviews came back, and and I really didn't have. I had a, a totally different name in mind for it, but for each book that I do after somebody reads it, I. I asked them, I said, what do you think about the title? And two of them said, the title needs to be the Sheriff of Star County. And I talked to them on the phone. I said, well, why, why would you say that to Sheriff of Star County? And says, well, that's what it's about. Wheels of Sheriff of Star County. So it, it really tells the story of what, it, of what it's about. I don't particularly... Uh, you know, because it's such a long title. If you'll notice my other book, Spring House, Adam's Daughters, uh, uh, Comanche Trace, uh, they got, this is the longest title I've ever, uh, I've ever had to deal with. And I've always been of the theory you keep your titles short, but uh, everybody seemed to want that, and I let, I let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> I gave them the big one. <laughs> yes, yes. And they come back with, you know, they, they these readers, you know, these people that really get into the books, uh, if an author doesn't listen to his readers, he's sure making a big mistake. Yep. Because, uh, you know, just I've had, had people, and one, one of the reviews that I got just recently from a lady uh, that I know, and she read the book, and I ran into her at a social event, I asked her what she thought about it, and she says, well, I didn't like the ending. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and she says, well, I, I didn't want it to end. I didn't want the story to end. And I said, well, don't worry. They're going to be another bit. <laughs> well, that's usually how it is. The ending is really like, you know, is there going to be another book? You know? Yes. So you got to yeah. leave it open, right? At the and end that's the why you write series. And, yeah. and I, I'm in the process of putting that all together. And I'm not exactly sure which direction I'm going to go with, uh, but I am going to. Will's getting pretty old. I'm going to have to. He's going to have to die here. <laughs> and a, a sad thing about Will is that's one thing on the vital statistics I don't have about him. His name was William W. Smith. One of the things we don't have on him is the date of birth or where he died. Oh. So that kind of gives me some liberty there, you know. If it if it if I knew, I would write it in just the way it is, and that's the way I've done it on everything, just the way it was. I mean, you, yeah, you know, people uh, who are doing their genealogy work. This book I wrote for for entertainment, but I put a little education in there, and the genealogy uh, of the family is in the book, not in a not in a structured way with your little trees and all, you know, that sort of thing. It's just, you know, it's there, you know, Will was 20, rather, matter of fact, today, no, on the 4th, Will, it was Will's birthday on the 4th of April. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was actually his, his birthday. And when he came, when he came to Texas with uh, uh, 11, with 10 other members of the family, he was 23 when he 
when he tapped, stepped on Texas soil. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I learned a lot. You asked the question earlier. I learned a lot about my family because I had to I had to memorize those things to to make the book work. And if I worked with it so much, uh, I had the documents in that Bible of when they were born, the children were born and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, you look at it, you don't pay a lot of attention to it. But once I spent, <laughs> I spent 20 years writing these five books and uh, um, I could have done it faster, uh, but I wanted to go to the places and I, I tell everybody, if it's in the book and I've described a place, I've been there. Well, that's I, went really cool. I think we're going to get into what is your tea? So if I ask you what your tea, what tea you're serving my guest tonight, David, what words are you going to give me for the TEA? The Texas Education Agency. And can you tell us a little bit about the Texas Education Agency? That's what we call our school system. Uh, our statewide school system, and they're kind of the overall of all, you know, the independent school districts in the state. And sometimes they do a good job, and sometimes they don't do such a good job. But um, they they have been the Texas Education Agency as long as I can remember, and that's where all of our um, decisions are made, um, how we teach our children, or don't teach them. <laughs> that sort of thing. And uh, the, uh, we've got a lot of things going on in Austin, Texas right now as the legislature's in session. Uh, we're a little different than, than most states. Uh, we only allow our legislatures to meet 140 days out of two years. And they got to finish their business in, 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 in uh, that 140 days. And they got 39 days left. And so you'd be surprised if we could, if every country did that and they can't go home, they can't adjourn, uh, they must adjourn at that time. But if, if, if they haven't balanced the budget for two years and if they haven't set aside a rainy, for the rainy day fund a certain amount of money, uh, they, can't, they can't gavel the clothes. I mean, they, they will have to reopen and, and start another session. But generally, they want to go home because they don't make a lot of money. So our Texas legislatures only make $600 a month. So they're ready to go home because they have other jobs. <laughs> so I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this question. We have a bunch of comments that are coming in and they want to know, like, your chairman, president, private schools. It's because all of my guests, I, I put you guys at the bottom here and I put like your award winning author, director, president, chairman and leader. Uh, David is a, a part of a lot of huge accomplishments. And I want to get into your accomplishments that you've you've come through, David, and share a little bit for the viewers and listeners out there on the, some of the accomplishments you've gotten is the Greater San Antonio Chambers of Commerce 1994 Business Leader of the Year Award Lifetime Membership Texas Association of Business Appointed of the White House Conference of Small Business 1995 Appointment Appointed by Mayor Nelson Wolf to the San Antonio Police Review Board served 1994 to 1998 Do you want to share a little bit on, the, on some of your accomplishments? Well, yeah. I like talking about my new uh, job now, but I, I've had three jobs in my life. I worked for Hiram Walker, Canadian company, for 26 years. Retired at 55, decided to open my own business, and, and which is still being ran by my daughter. And after I had my accident and rehabilitation, she stepped in and kind of take, took over the business. And she's running it good and put it on steroids. And I had time to write. Uh, but during that time that I was running the business, I, uh, San Antonio meant a lot to me. It, it was home. I moved. Uh, I was originally born. I was born in Austin, but I moved to San Antonio in, in uh, 68. And uh, I immediately got involved in community affairs. Uh, and and uh, Hemisphere 68 was one of them. And I that was a world fair, by the way. You 
you weren't born in. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I wasn't even uh, thought about. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I, I found that from from the hemisphere and and working with the Chamber of Commerce and and doing different things, uh, I was involved in small business. Uh, served on the trust as a trustee of the of a, a, a national. Uh, a small, a small NFIB, they call it, National Federation of Independent Businessmen, and um, served on a lot of boards and committees. And and uh, um, I, I tell you, when uh, when the uh, Rodney King thing happened out in California, um, at that time I was on the uh, Greater San Antonio uh, Crime Prevention Commission. It's now called a Public Safety Commission, but uh, I call. Uh, I called the mayor at that time, his name, it, 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 Nelson Wolf was his name, and he's been a good friend for many years. And I told him, I said, you know, this could happen to us, what's happened out there, the rioting and all that sort of stuff. And, and what kind of thing do we have set up now, uh, you know, for when police overstep their bounds? And, and he says, well, we have a police review board. And I said, well, are there any civilians on it? And he says, no, there's not. I said, we need to fix that. And you know what? He went, the next week he went to the city council meeting and they decided to do it. And I was the first one they put on the board. The first, first civilian they put on the board. So yeah, I, I and I, I'll tell you what, uh, someone asked me once uh, what it was like, and I said, if you could imagine serving on a grand jury for four years, I was on that board for four years, and I saw about, I, I heard over 250 cases, and we had to make a decision uh, whether that policeman would stay or go, and sometimes, uh, or, or take a 30-day, you know, with a suspension with no pay, uh, then you had the responsibility to the to the um, uh, uh, to the citizen who made the complaint, and I'll tell you what I wouldn't wish that on my, of my worst enemy. <laughs> I did it, and I got into it. I had no idea how how tough it would be, but it was one. And and uh, what they did with me is they put me in a police car, and I I I went patrolled on every every shift that they had around San Antonio, saw some things that, man, and and you just don't understand what those policemen have to do and how fast, fast they have to react. And uh, it, 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 it was one of the toughest jobs I ever had. And it put some years on me for four years because there were some deaths involved in that situation that I had to make a decision one way or the other. And uh, it was hard because you look at the, you know, you look at all the information and then you had to make a decision. And yes, that's what uh, the police review board was. I think every city ought to have one. If they don't, they ought to get one. So not every city, not every city has one. No, not as, you know, there are little small towns, I'm sure, that don't have. But a lot of them have, it's just policemen on the board. Well, what, what use is that? You stop to think oh, wow. about that. You know, because they're going to say, well, there's nothing but policemen on that board. Now they have citizens on the board and and, and it kind of it, it weighs the situation. I will be the first to tell you that I was shocked to find out that when it came to when we when we decided someone had overstepped their bounds and we had to start uh, issuing what we recommend as punishment, the, cert the, the, the certified officers were tougher than the civilians on the on the board. Wow. They were really tough on on their own. Policemen don't like bad cops. So back in the in your stories, like when you did some of your history on your family there, David, was there some of the police, like sheriffs and that in your family as well? Is that like through yes, the Yes, there are a lot of a lot of law enforcement uh uh, people in my family, and uh, actually, were the three Texas Rangers. There's been and an old uncle that I had. I remember him. <laughs> he was he was a constable in the south of the river there, and he was he was called Law Law South of the Colorado. 
<laughs> the police, Austin police didn't hardly go over there. Like, they kind of left him along. <laughs> and I used to ride with him. I rode with him as a, uh, my mother was sick for a while and, and uh, wasn't able to take care of me. And she, he and his wife took me in. And, and I, I had to, you know, uh, one, he picked me up at school and he, then he got a call and he, he had to take me on. <laughs> he had to take me with him. <laughs> Probably today they wouldn't, they wouldn't look too good on that. But, you know, that's the way things were in most days. So are there still Texas Rangers? Oh, certainly. Yes. The Texas Rangers still exist. Uh, they're about 254 strong. It's a very, uh, uh, you, you have to work your way up through law enforcement, uh, usually through the State Department of Public Safety as highway patrolmen. And they, they, they look and when they have openings coming up, I believe the number is 254. They keep it at that. And that's the number of counties we have. One ranger for every county. And so when an opening's coming up, they, uh, uh, they, you know, start interviewing and, and so once someone gets that status and it, they're, they're very much like the F FBI. Uh, they're only called in uh, when, when it, something that steps over the bound, uh, you, you'll hear about, you know, the Texas Rangers are involved in a case maybe where, uh, where there's, uh, uh, might be a, 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 a po politicians especially, they love to get politicians. And one Texas Ranger friend I know have, uh, uh, he and I belong to the Texas Rangers Association. Uh, he, he told me one time. I asked him. I said, "Do you, you ever, did you, you ever put a, a, a bank robber in jail?" And he says, "No, but I put a lot of bankers in jail." <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're a good group, and uh, they I belong to the farmer. Uh, it's called a farmer. I'm not not a farmer, F A R, but farmer, F O R, Farmer Texas Rangers Association, and and they also have a foundation up in Kerrville, uh, I mean Fredericksburg, Texas, and um, I I do some things for for them on that. They help me out some on my books and speaking engagements and that sort of thing. So we have a question yeah. here for you, David. You're all right. <laughs> oh, did you lose me? Yeah, I well, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear. What oh, you I must have skipped out. <laughs> okay. So we have a question here. It says, what message do you have for the people who don't like police? Well, the people that don't like police probably don't like anybody. You know, there's people like that. Uh, uh, I, I There's not much you can do about it. If people hate, they're going to hate. And that, that's why uh, whatever, you know, gun control or whatever, it's hate that we got to stop. Uh, you know, people that are going to do these bad things, regardless, where, and I'm not going to get political on this, but uh, uh, there are certain people that just aren't happy and you can't make them happy. And, uh, you know, I just try and leave those kind of people alone. That's that's what I say. And if they don't like police, like I said, they probably don't like anybody. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's, there's some, let me tell you, out of every policeman, I, I figured it down. We had two, at the time I was on that, on that commission, uh, that they had 2000 policemen and there were only about 22 who were doing all the complaints that we had and it was you know they would get into trouble out of trouble and i'd usually after a second or third time i i my recommendation to the police chief is says cut your losses and get this guy out of here before he causes some problems but that means the difference they were all good yeah and it, i used to would meet a policeman out in a I'd always, if I saw a policeman in a restaurant or something and they were having coffee or lunch or whatever, I'd always pick up the tab. It didn't cost that much. And <laughs> policeman asked me, said, well, who are you? And I said, David Bowles. And I, oh, you're on the, 
<laughs> you're on a police review board. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's me. And, and he says, uh, I've never met you. And I said, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like anything, right? Yes, yes. And so, yeah, I answered the guy. Uh, I don't know how else to say that, but, you know, you know, it's kind of like people say, well, I don't like teachers. Well, you know, they probably don't like, you know, whatever, you know, they don't like preachers or they don't like lawyers or nothing anybody can do about that. Uh, but, you know, uh, some of these people may have a legitimate claim. Uh, a policeman may have, they think, done them wrong. Yep. If your if your town has a police review board, take the complaint to the. It's most cities. It's called civilian police review board, and that's the place you can go. You got a complaint, put it. Civilians like me will listen to you, and if you got a good complaint, that officer might need to go. Well, and you, you see that answering. happening. Thank you for you answering that. that yeah, I hope, hope I did. Okay. Well, I, 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 and it's like anything, right? There's, there's good and there's bad in any field. It's not just policemen there, you know, there's good and bad doctors or good and bad teachers. There's, you know, that's just how life is. We have our good and we have our bad and we just have to, you know, not judge everybody that has that title because of one bad person. You know, uh, if we have a, one bad cop and we have 10 good cops, we're not going to punish the 10 good cops because of one yeah. bad one. The number's 1%. And I want to tell you, it's it, that 1% rule is pretty, you know, that there's only 1% of people that hate policemen. And there's only 1% of people that commit crimes. And I rode with one officer, his name was Eddie Perez. His father was a great friend of mine, and I was with him, the son, and I'm riding on a, on, uh, with him on a cruise. And we went to a thing that was over a dog. And the people, both sides, he, was, he wasn't trying to take sides or anything. He was just trying to tell them what they needed to do. And both of them treated him terribly, spoke to him horribly. And we ended up, we got back in the car and I said, you know, I don't know, Eddie, how you can do, how, how you handle this. And he said, you know what? He said, did you see those people across on the other side of the street standing there? And I said, yes. And he says, I could tell they were waiting there to step in if I if they if I needed help. And he said, you know, for every one person that might want to harm a policeman, there's 99 that'll, that'll step in to try and save his life. And I've seen that happen. That happens here in Texas quite a bit. You'll see policemen on, on the ground wrestling with somebody and two or three cars will pull up and uh, they'll help the officer out. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it's it's one percent. That's what I say. So I'm not going to worry about that one percent. I'm going to enjoy those ninety nine percent of the people who like me and I like them. And I understand, uh, you know, I don't put everybody in a, in a box because of one bad person, one bad seed, you know, because there's ninety nine good seeds out there. So why should we invest? Those 99 because of one bad one. That's you know? exactly. so I, I want to thank this uh, viewer and this listener for their questions and that. Well, that's a good uh, but question. I, wanna, I, I was surprised at that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do get questions from all over and that we are streaming multiple places. So, again, thank you for your question. I do appreciate that. But, David, I want to get into some of the other stuff that you've done. You've done police work, but you've also done, uh, you're an honorary chairman for the San Antonio March of Dimes, the Western Gala, uh, was back in 1996. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the March of Dimes? Because That's, uh, the March of Dimes, you know, that, that, that was for polio originally. And uh, March of Dimes uh, then became uh, uh, birth defects. And uh, do you have in Canada a March of Dimes? Uh, is that a, a, a I'm charity? I'm not sure. sure. Okay. Well, it started out when a dime was worth something, of course. And it started out long before the <laughs> cure for polio. And they had a lot to do with, with helping Jonas Salk uh, and, and, and funding his uh, search for, uh, uh, for a cure for polio, which he did. And, but once the cure came... And that's the interesting thing about this is that when a cure comes, it puts a lot of people out of business. 
And you think about some of these uh, illnesses that we have, like cancer. They, they keep looking for a treatment that nobody's really trying to find a cure. And that's that's a problem. But uh, the March of Dimes was one of those associations that I felt a lot for. And uh, actually, my secretary was heavily involved in that in that organization. And the year before, and I don't put this I don't put this on my uh, deal. But I was the bachelor of the year. And I raised the most money being the Bachelor of the Year uh, uh, for the auction and, and raised the most money. And matter of fact, I raised more money than all the other <laughs> the guys competing with me <laughs> put together. And so the next year, they wanted to do something for me. So they made me an honorary uh, chairman of, of, the, of the next gala. And uh, my, 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 we, Today we call them administrative assistants. But my my administrative assistant did all the work. I just went and bought me a good old black cowboy hat and I wore my black tux. And <laughs> I, that's well, about what I did. <laughs> and, oh well, I, I did. I so did, you didn't I get said, a blue tux. You got a black one. No, I didn't get a blue tux. I, I, I had a black. Matter, matter of fact, uh, uh, my administrative assistant at that time she told me she said. Uh, you wear a black tux and you don't, you know, and see, I don't wear a typical tie. I wear a bolo. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm not wearing a, a bow tie. I'm going to wear a bolo tie. And this was, a, this is what I wore at that gala. <laughs> yeah. My dad used to wear one all the time too. Yeah. They're, they're just handy. You get them off. And of course I lost the use of my right arm. And uh, so I can't tie a tie. <laughs> so this, this makes it really perfect. <laughs> so do you have those uh, Western snap shirts? Uh, snap shirts? Uh, well, no, like they're buttons. Like little snaps that just go snap, snap, snap? No, no, I, I refuse to do that. I have a little uh, thing that does my buttons. And I, I have my shirts made and, and, and uh, they... I, they asked me, so you want to put snaps? And I don't like snaps. I just still try to do the buttons, but it's pretty tough for me sometimes to to get a button, get a button done. So I want to get into the color blue. You gave me the color blue. Why the color blue? Well, you know, the sky is blue. And I think that's beautiful. I know there's nothing beautiful more beautiful than a than a West Texas sky. Oh, I like that answer. So they had beautiful uh, sunsets and sunrises. Yes, back yes, they do. And I found the further you go west, the prettier the sunsets are. <laughs> yeah. So you gave me the word determined to, decide, to describe yourself as a person. Why that word determined? Well, I had a learning disability as a child, and I had a real difficult time. And I used to drive the teachers nuts because I was fidgeting and, and, and causing problems. <laughs> Can't tell you how many times my parents had to go to school, <laughs> set me down and talk to me. But I just had a real hard time studying. Uh, while the teacher was talking, I was looking out at that beautiful blue sky and the butterflies flying. And, and I really didn't give a damn about their English or what. <laughs> I was doing my own thing, and uh, 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 unfortunately, I didn't. In a, in a, my senior year, uh, my my teacher told me, and matter of fact, it was my second run at trying to get uh, graduated from high school. She said to me, "She says, uh, you know, you're just not college material. Why don't you just go out and, and why don't you join the service?" And I thought about it. And that's what I did. I left. I left school one day. I went down. A day I turned 17 years old. I went down to the Naval Reserve uh, uh, office down there and signed up. And within a few weeks, I I was off and and I didn't get to graduate with my class. And uh, but you know I didn't let that. It made when I came back. <clears throat> from the service, uh, I, I trying to find a job and, you know, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't graduate from high school. I went, we have something in Texas, we, I got it through the Navy, a GED, 
which is probably just as good. But I've had to pretty well educate myself because in a classroom environment, I couldn't pay attention to, to the class. And even now, I go off and 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 uh, go and take a conference or something and try to listen to a keynote speaker that I want to hear. But if I can get their tape and sit down and listen to it, I can, you know, I can catch it, get it, and I got it. And uh, determine I didn't let the fact that I didn't have an education. Most of the people, I'd, when I went to work for Hiram Walker, and I got on with Hiram Walker, um, they didn't ask me uh, uh, about my education advance. Uh, they saw me working at Hemisphere 68, and they said, we want that boy. And that's how I ended up with them and spent 26 years in the alcoholic beverage business uh, before getting out in, at, at the age of 55 and starting my own business. So I've had three, you know, uh, things. I've tried and made them all a success. And I'll tell you, I've all the careers of, well, I haven't only had three careers, careers, but I've had several businesses along the way and they've all been successful. And out of everything uh, that I've done, writing is the easiest and most enjoyable of anything I've ever done. But <laughs> it's the hardest work to get done. When you get the book finished, the work just begins. The fun's over, and I'm going to tell you, you're doing things like I do two or three uh, of these uh, weekly uh, uh, podcast and things. But before these podcast and things came through personal, I got in my car. I called around radio stations, uh, uh, radio stations, TV. Back in those days, you'd go and they're tickled to death to get somebody to talk to them at, at their noon show or, 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 you know, whatever. I did drive time shows. I, and I drove 100, 200 miles sometimes. <laughs> and I can tell you, at my age, I'm really glad that we're doing this on Zoom and stream. <laughs> stream <laughs> 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 but it, 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 it is work. And, uh, you know, I've done book signings, I, uh, you know, with the new book out. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, I drive th two or 300 miles, go to a bookstore in the Dallas market. And uh, uh, don't get out of the store until eight or nine o'clock. And uh, it, it, it's tough business. And, and anyone that gets into it, uh, it <laughs> there are a lot of other things a lot easier to do, Liz, as you probably know. <laughs> there is a lot. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm if anybody with you doing all I just got to say, I was impressed with you doing as many of these podcasts as you've done. <laughs> I've already done 40 and we're only in April. So, and I, wow. I got another 112 to do. So I'm doing wow. no, 116 more to go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be a full, full year for tea time. So if anybody would like to get your books, David, where can they get your books? Well, of course, any bookstore can get them. Uh, they're, they're available on Amazon.com. Uh, and and uh, my website is uh, David A. Bowles, author, the word author at the end, dot com. Uh, David A. Bowles dot com. And I also have the Westward Sagas, which is Westward Sagas dot com. And that's spelled W E S T W A R D S A G A S dot com. And everybody has a hard time with that. <laughs> they want to put, because I'm an author, they want to put the word uh, W W O R D instead of W A R D. <laughs> so they have some problems with that. Uh, so, but uh, I hope they'll try uh, take a look at one of my books. Uh, on my website, I've got a, a special on there for uh, a great special on there. They, they buy the whole set, which is a good way to read the set. Uh, of course, they might want to just buy one and check it out. But this map I've got over on this side, 
is uh, uh, offered for free. It's, it's a map of Texas back in the period of 1845 to 1850. I found that map and it gave me so much knowledge about where Texas was. Uh, I don't know if you can see or not that map over my- Yeah, I see the map. Yeah. Well, it goes all the way up to, to, to the Wyoming border. A lot of people don't realize Texas went that far. And then eventually Texas sold uh, 63 million acres back to the United States, which that then became New Mexico, Colorado, and all, all the states there. So, but that's a beautiful map suitable for framing. And I, if anyone buys the full set of my books, they get that map for free. And it's oh. a collector's oh. item, a collector's item mounted on 65 pound, uh, I mean, mounted on, it's not mounted, it's, it's printed on the 65 pound paper, so. It's a beautiful thing. So any plans for book six? Yes, it's right here on my desk right here. You can't see it, but <laughs> it's right here. I'm working on it. And I'm also trying to do a nonfiction uh, about uh, the family ranch and what happened to it. Uh, uh, and, and the history of it, because it was in my family for three for three generations. And, um, and so about the time, uh, about the time I'd gotten in the liquor business. Oh, wow. So you're in the liquor business. So you do make whiskey. Well, we made it big time. And, and uh, I'll tell you what, my, my dad and his brothers, I, I have good reason to believe that they made it too back during prohibition time. And I cornered him on that one day, and I said, Dad, my dad's been dead for quite a few years ago. I said, Dad, uh, I found that picture of you, you and my mother back in, 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 in about 1939. And I said, you, that was during the Depression. That sure was a fancy Ford Coupe you had for the day. And he just looked at me and he says, son, you might not be the first person, first member of this family to be in the liquor business. You just might be the first one to have a liquor license. <laughs> <laughs> so it runs in the family. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. It runs in the family. But I had a lot of fun working for Iron Walker. They were great people to their employees. Well, I really want to thank you, David, for joining me on Tea Time and sharing a good, strong cup of tea. Texas Education Agency, we're going to have to look into that. And you got your cup. So I always love when my tea time guests bring a cup of tea because then I know that they love the tea, too. So, uh, David, any final words before we wrap up your tea time tonight? I, I didn't hear that. Uh, oh, I missed. Any final words before we wrap up your tea time tonight? You want to find some words? Your final words. Final. <laughs> Sorry, I wear my hair. I think my batteries are getting low. My batteries are getting Maybe low. Maybe it's my ears that are acting up. No, it's my ears. I, I tell you, I, 80 years old, I, 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 my hearing is not as good as it once was. But uh, uh, the final words are, it, it, I just hope that, you know, everybody that writes um, finds them a good reader and and they and they give them a good story and i encourage all the independent writers that there are out there today and i mean there are millions to do good work and you'll get good readers well thank you so much and it was a real honor to sit and spill some tea with you and get to know texas a little bit better and i got to see a little map and i got to see some incredible books and if anybody would like to grab a copy of these books, check out David's website. Uh, check out all of the links that have been put into the comments if you're checking that out. Check out Miss Liz's Tea Time YouTube channel. Give it a quick subscribe, ring the bell, and you can see all these incredible tea times at any time you want. You can watch them 100 times if you want. You watch them over and over. If you want to reach out to any of my guests, please reach out to me, Miss Liz, at my, book, at my email at bookingmissliz at, at gmail.com. And again, David, thank you so much for sitting and spilling a good, strong cup of tea tonight with me on Tea Time. 
And again, thank you to the viewers and supporters. Thank you for the questions. We really appreciate them. And I want to thank everybody. And I will see everybody next Thursday for three new shows, three new flavors, and new, three new stories. You just never know where we're going to be traveling next week. This week, we travel to the United States and Canada. Next week, we don't know where we're going. So you'll have to stay tuned because we travel the world with Miss Liz and Tea Time. So again, thank you all. And I will see you all Thursday, 10 a.m. for the first Tea Time then 3 p.m. in the afternoon and 7 p.m. in the evening. And again, thank you, David, for an amazing tea time tonight. Don't leave. I'm just going to close up the live.